Welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Lee Dupuis and I am a volunteer with the Costume Society of America's Conversations on Dress webinar series. CSA thanks you for joining us for this evening's discussion titled Theorizing LGBTQIA Plus Style, Fashion and Dress. This community historically and today has engaged in unique styles and fashions drawing upon multiple and mixed aesthetics. These styles and visual signifiers change and shift in different contexts, interactions, and embodied practices. We are joined this evening by an esteemed group of panelists from a range of backgrounds who will share with us their work, perspectives, and insights on style, fashion, and dress in the LGBTQIA community. We've developed a resource document to accompany tonight's panel discussion to provide a selection of recommended readings, exhi exhibition websites, videos, and more. This document is by no means exhaustive, but it's intended as a way to start. And if you have general questions or would like to volunteer uh, for CSA digital content, please contact Conversations on Dress at CostumeSocietyAmerica.com. Without further ado, let's please welcome our moderator for today. Dr. Kelly Reddy Best is an associate professor at Iowa State University in apparel, merchandising, and design. In her research, she examines the interrelationships of dress, identity, consumption, and the fashion system with a social justice lens. She taught courses across the apparel curriculum in design, product development, merchandising, culture, and history, and co-curated the exhibition Queer Fashion and Style Stories from the Heartland at Iowa State University in 2018. She will now introduce today's presenters. Uh, so the purpose of our panel today is to dig uh, deeper into the concepts of ambivalence and ambiguity in style, fashion, and dress in relation to the LGBTQIA plus community. We are hosting this panel during Pride Month um, in the United States, which is named in honor of the Stonewall Riots, one of the many um, moments in history where queer and trans uh, people fought back against police brutality and um, systemic oppression. We honor and recognize the community organizers and activists who were at the forefront of these resistance movements. The four panelists we have here today, who I am personally very big fans of, um, have produced highly critical and thought-provoking uh, fashion studies scholarship centering on the LGBTQIA plus community and intersections with disability, Black feminist thought, um, uh, BDSM, kink, fat bodies, uh, feminist queer crip, and other uh, critical ideologies. So the discussion will center around the four um, manuscripts by our panelists um, that are pictured here on the slides. Um, and I highly recommend that you all um, engage with them if you haven't already. Uh, so our panelists include um, Dr. Ben Barry, uh, who is chair in the School of Fashion at Ryerson University, and in July will join Parsons School of Design as the Dean of Fashion and Associate Professor of Equity and Inclusion. Congrats on your new position, Dr. Berry. Um, his research examines the relationships between gender and fashion, focusing on the everyday and the entanglements of gender with queer, fat, and disabled embodiments. Uh, next, we also have Dr. Denisha Blake, who holds degrees in women's studies and communication, earning her PhD from the University of Maryland College Park. And she currently serves as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Alma College. Her research brings together Black feminist thought, uh, fashion studies, digital humanities, and performance studies. <coughs> next, we have um, Dr. Andy um, Campbell, who is an associate professor of critical studies at USC's Roski School of Art and Design in LA. Uh, he is an art historian, critic and curator and author of Bound Together, Leather, Sex, Archives and Contemporary Art and Queer X Design, 50 Years of Signs, Symbols, Banners, Logos and Graphic Art of LGBTQ. Uh, finally, we have Dr. Michael Mamp, uh, who is a professor of fashion merchandising and design at Central Michigan University, where he teaches courses including queer fashion. Uh, and his research explores the history of the 20th century to reveal um, the stories and contributions of the LGBTQ plus community and women using a sartorial lens. All right. so. Um, I'm very honored to uh, moderate our very esteemed um, 
uh, scholars here. Uh, so we're going to start with our first question to learn just a little bit about some of the work they have produced and that we will discuss today. Um, so can you first each just just very briefly tell us about your research and how you have approached this particular topic? Uh, so my most current research that's coming out in Dress um, any day now is about Charles Pierce, who was a prominent female impersonator of the mid to late 20th century. Um, and I'm really interested in the history of dress, history of fashion, but specifically to reveal the stories that have been hidden. Um, and I was very fortunate in this particular study to have access to archival materials held at the one archive at the University of Southern California, um, which typically doesn't collect dress, but does have some of the costumes and accessories that Pierce wore during his career. So this is a project that employed historical method, material culture, and took me from archives to New York to California. Um, and I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk to an audience about it today. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, Denisha, would you like to go next? Sure. So um, my research is looking at um, people who identify as women, queer, black women and lesbian um, who are involved in uh, what I term fashion activism, um, which I'll kind of talk a little bit um, later on about what, what I mean by that. but. I was really interested in not just only their aesthetic choices, but really what the, the cultural work of what they were doing um, and, and thinking about how they were employing tenets of Black feminism. Um, so I'm trained as a Black feminist scholar, and I wanted to see how were they um, projecting these ideas through the, the, their work with fashion. Um, and so a lot of my work is in the digital realm uh, I looked at, you know, uh, women in menswear, bloggers, um, folks who were um, producing queer style or queer fashion uh, blogs, as well as the web series. That's the, the subject of the article that you see. And so um, that's where my work took me and did um, a lot of different methods to really engage with this and see how were they um, thinking about um, or actually intentionally or unintentionally um, performing tenets of Black feminism in their work. Thank you very much. Um, ben, would you like to go next? Thanks so much, Kelly. I'm so excited to be here and what an incredible panel of scholars. I'm all such a big fan of, so I'm honored uh, to be part of this. My work, I think, really looks at fashion um, as a form of activism and particularly in how faculty and students can mobilize fashion design, fashion shows, fashion communication to really intervene into the neoliberal capitalist fashion industry. And to do that by centering marginalized communities as active designers and creators. So really to claim and reclaim fashion to not just intervene into the dominant system, but really to continue to make their own worlds, worlds that are authentic and true to them. And so the paper I'll be talking about today is a paper I actually uh, co-authored with my husband. And uh, it was based on a project we did with queer and trans youth to through a process that I'll talk about called fashion hacking. Um, and really as an intervention into right-wing politics, into the fashion industry, and particularly into uh, homonationalism, Jasmine Poir's concept, um, where we move away from this kind of acceptable queerness of white cisgender uh, maleness into so many queer and trans folks that have been uh, excluded from that sort of single issue queer struggle. Thank you very much, Ben. And um, Andy? Yeah, hi. Thank you so much, Kelly, again, for having us here and to all the fellow panelists. I I want to kind of ditto what Ben says. It's really a it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you and everyone who's attending. And thanks to CSA too. Um, you know, my I was um, kind of trained up as an art historian and taught to kind of not look at design in some ways. And so design um, is a much more recent part of my kind of research portfolio, if you will. Um, and uh, really it comes through thinking about queer community and the terms that queer community is 
kind of visually leveraged in the public realm and in the private. So um, dress and fashion are, of course, a key part of that. And uh, the work that I'll be talking to or speaking to today is a component of um, what was my dissertation, then my first kind of academic monographic book, um, and an article in dress, um, which was about one of the archives that I was looking at, which was an itinerant um, archive that belongs to um, uh, a woman named Viola Johnson and her partner, Jill Carter. Um, and really, it is about the ways in which kind of an item of her devising becomes a lens to look at kind of broader BDSM histories and cultures in the United States. So um, for me, in this context, um, fashion or dress is a way of kind of opening out onto broader community histories and kind of telling those through lots of different means, including oral history. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna start my questions off. Um, my first one is for Denisha. So in your um, publication, It Ain't He, It Ain't She, it's We, the Politics of Self-Definition and Self-Valuation in the Androgynous Model web series, you discuss Nikki Eason. So can you talk about just who she is and her relationship to um, queer Black women's fashion, specifically fashion activism? Yes. Yeah, so um, at the time where, when I was doing my research, I don't even know how I came across her. Um, I think she was featured in Dapper Q um, and uh, the, the blog. And I think they did a sort of profile on her. And then of course, I am a type of, the type of person to go down the rabbit hole, like who is this person? Let's, let's see what this androgynous uh, model show is. And um, you know, and I got a chance to actually talk to her and, and speak with her. So at the time that she produced the show, she was an aspiring model who was trying to break into the fashion industry. And she was really inspired by Tyra Banks's, you know, infamous show, <laughs> America's Next Top Model. And one of the things that she would say is that, you know, I saw these androgynous models on the show, but oftentimes I felt like she was wanting them to be more feminine in their presentation. And that's just not who I am. I enjoy menswear. I do lean more masculine, even though I consider myself an androgynous model. Um, and so she wanted to create her own show and, and really bring along these five um, you know, women who were um, you know, trying to also do that as well, per participate in the fashion industry as androgynous model. Thanks, Denisha. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, because um, Nikki was such a big part of, um, you know, the creation of this web series and of your critical analysis. And, um, right. you know, uh, Nikki did such like, an, such, was doing such important work. So I wanted to just sort of ground the audience and like, who is this person and in relation to, um, this particular, um, you know, phenomena that had like emerged online. Yeah, and yeah. so my second question for you, um, Denisha, is so you had used this concept of queer style. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell us, you know, what is this concept and why was it an important analytic tool for um, your work on this project specifically? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, black queer for the that term um, before we get to style, I like to always like attribute terms to who I found them from, especially when I got it from a place where it's kind of like in a like a you know I, the blog that I found it really wasn't like publicized or in the, or or circulating in the academic world, and it's really easy for someone who is an academic to take up a term and then get all the credit for it, and then you know, it, that person never gets that. So I always tell people that is from, um, they, their name is now T. Anasti Wilson um, and a part of their blog, Black Queer Flow. And I really appreciated what their work was doing at the time, which was to not think only about Black and queer as two separate things or two communities of style that Black queer people are navigating, but really looking at those liminal spaces and the ways in which um, Black queer folks are, in, like Blackness is informing their queer identity or queerness is also informing who they are as Black folks. And so I took that term and I was thinking about already thinking about Black queer style, but I was like, hmm, I like this better. This, this fits where I'm trying to go because I really am trying to look more 
less about aesthetic, although when I talk about it in the longer project, I do say that Black queer style is an aesthetic of Black queer folks, but I also think about it in terms of the way it's a form of praxis and, and, and specifically a Black feminist praxis. Um, and so I look at, um, so Alice Walker, who uh, wrote The Color Purple, did, does this um, um, in, in Search of Our Mother's Garden, she does this like litany of definitions for womanism. And so I do the same thing and I talk about Black queer style as self-definition, Black queer style self-valuation, Black queer style is um, taking up space. And all of those things to me are things that Black feminists have been talking about for decades. And what I'm trying to do is map that into or theorize it um, what I'm seeing these queer women doing um, with their fashion activism. And I think I forgot to kind of define that earlier. Um, and so I think about fashion activism as the labor that I see marginalized communities in particular undertaking to really say, to really leverage fashion style and dress to, to affirm who they are, to build communities and um, resist oppressive structures. So um, I look at the work of Nikki Eason as trying to really engage in this sort of affirmative practice of of defining who she is as an androgynous model against a, a, a larger framework that says, this is what we think <laughs> androgynous people are, fashion is, and also bringing along and opening up space for a sort of collective moment in which other Black women, other Black queer women are able to engage in the practice of, of self-valuation and things like that. So that's what the term is. That's how it kind of evolved in sort of my, my process of developing the concept. Thank you. And can you just briefly tell us, like, who do we see pictured here on the slide? <laughs> oh, let's see. And how is this really in relation to your work? <laughs> just so the audience can know. <laughs> Now, this is the cast of the androgynous model web series. So again, it was modeled, if you know the framework of America's Next Top Model, they have all of these models come in and they per, uh, participate in different kinds of competitions throughout the series. And they're eliminated <laughs> after, after their performance. They're judged and then, you know, they decide. Um, and so this is the original cast of the show, the first season. Okay, great. Thank you. I just wanted to, for the folks who maybe haven't yet engaged with your amazing article, I just wanted to make sure folks knew who we were who we were looking at. So thank you so much, Sinisha. <laughs> uh, so my next uh, question uh, is for um, Ben. Uh, so Ben, in your um, work, you had mentioned how during the fashion hackathon that the queer and trans youth created sort of these quote imagined futures. So can you? you know, talk a little bit about like what this, like what the, what does that mean? Like imagined features and, you know, why is it important? And and then not only like what it means and why it was important, but like then how is it actualized? And so we're looking at, and maybe just tell us a little bit about what we're what we're looking at here. So for the folks who maybe haven't engaged. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think as a Canadian, probably in the US, Canada has this like very heavenly, image of being this like this beautiful place but right the reality is like in the u.s um the land was stolen from indigenous people uh it's a place that obviously is, is very deep lived realities of racism of homophobia of other forms of discrimination and so this project really started off as a project to engage queer and trans youth in the making of fashion and through that making to explore their understandings of their intersectional gender and sexual identities. Um, but what happened is as we were kind of moving into the project, uh, a very right wing conservative government was elected in the province of Ontario. And part of that government's platform was to repeal the progressive sexual education curriculum in high school and remove all knowledge, all teaching around LGBT plus uh, gender and sexual experiences and identities. And so when we did this project, we came into a time when um, really queer and trans youth were under attack by the government. 
And so this project became a place for them to imagine futures that were not being represented in their schools, not in their homes, and for many of them, not in their communities. And so we created this fashion hacking. And so what that really was, it was uh, sort of borrowed in many ways from Otto von Busch and uh, his concept of fashion hacking. But also, of course, it's a concept that for many marginalized communities and many low income communities, the idea of taking clothes, taking them apart, remaking them, making them fit, um, making them appear to one's body and style is very common. So this is not something we created in any way. But it was a project where youth were given kind of worked in three different phases. First, they were given a series of contemporary fashion magazines and were asked to kind of rip these up and recreate them to imagine their desired futures. And this is one of the collages from one of the groups of young people that were imagining what, how they would represent themselves in fashion magazines, what this would look like. Um, and you see on sort of one of them, one of the participants put like, I think bees. And for them, that was, she was imagining her ideal life with her wife where they would have a bee farm and uh, they would sort of live off their farm, have their bees and be in their own kind of secluded world. Uh, the second part was actual clothing hacking. And so all the youth uh, got a certain amount of money. We went to a secondhand store, they picked clothing, more about the textures and fabrics and materials that spoke to them. They came back to the workshop space and we worked with them to create outfits that represented their understanding of identities that fit their bodies. And then the third part of the project was a fashion show where they actually co-created a fashion show to showcase what they made. Um, and so for them, this was a way, through all these three phases, was a way not just to sort of talk back to the fashion industry, but really to create their own communities outside of that right-wing government, outside of their schools, outside of the fashion industry, where they could use fashion style and dress to express who they are and affirm who they were in ways that were truthful and authentic to them. Um, and while this is something that many, many marginalized communities have always done, part of this experience was to share skills. So for us as faculty members and for our research assistants who were students at the university, to share skills with young people about how do you make clothes? What are skill sets to create your own outfits, to alter outfits, to create fashion shows that you might wanna do with your friends. And so a big part of this was really kind of a redistribution of knowledge and power from kind of a privileged side of a university um, to communities that didn't have access to this knowledge in the same way. Thanks, Ben. And then I believe that this shirt was part of that phase too. So can you just want to just tell us like very quickly like about about this shirt and like how, how the um, participant sort of was thinking through this? Yeah, I mean, this was we had a big conversation right throughout about right wing populism and how that had something that we had you know had seen in the US that had come to Canada, how this was like centered in obviously the American government at the time and now the Ontario government. What did that mean? And so this was obviously a play on Trump's very famous campaign slogan and taking this and finding ways to reclaim this. And so for this participant, it was a direct reclaiming. And I'll say that this happened in many different ways for folks who look at the article. Um, someone had taken sort of a hat that had uh, sort of a religious kind of a Christian, it was about preach. And for them, they said like, I think it was like, preach queerness, um, someone else wrote psycho on their shirt to kind of reclaim that pejorative as a way to affirm their neurodivergence, um, ways that they were using clothes to take pejoratives or kind of hack pejoratives um, that were related to not just their queerness or transness, but the way that intersected with fat, with neurodivergence, um, with religious upbringings, with so many other things. and using fashion as a way to kind of reclaim those for themselves. And so that's really one example of what this shirt represents. Great, thanks, Ben. Next, I'm gonna move uh, to Andy. And um, so Andy, can you tell us about Viola Johnson, um, who's pictured here? <laughs> um, and uh, she's a black lesbian submissive, also known as Mama V. Um, 
and um, and her pin sash. And so, and specifically, you know, how did the sash and pins relate to her, um, relate to and communicate leather sexuality? Yeah, so um, uh, Vi Johnson um, is in the picture on the left. She's the one that's staring right at the camera with this really kind of amazing uh, look and the and the tail, the braided tail that's coming down from the back of her head. Um, she is, as you say, um, a queer, lesbian, kind of submissive, um, someone who has been interested in a long time for, uh, uh, you know, about telling communal histories and stories. I first encountered her at the um, National Leather Association Conference in Dallas when I was a, a grad student beginning on this project, which was largely about leather communities, archives, and contemporary artists who pick up kind of the um, visual coding of leather and kind of make new work with it, um, either from the archives or from a kind of sense of kind of general communal history. Um, and she has a traveling or itinerant archive. So one of the things I was looking at is kind of what is an archive and what makes an archive. Um, and she and her partner started um, to gather material sourced from eBay um, and to take it around to leather events all around the country. Um, they would load up a van and literally drive this stuff to hotel conference rooms and ballrooms and set this up so that um, people within the community would have kind of access to historical materials. And I found that to be a really um, moving way to kind of build off of what um, uh, what the previous uh, panelists were saying, a, a really moving way of um, kind of enacting a kind of activist um, uh, stance around kind of knowledge and knowledge production within the within the community. Um, so she is wearing in that photograph this leather pin sash. I mean, you can actually see it displayed on the table at the bottom right photograph. And this is something, as far as I can tell, that is totally a vise devising. Um, and in fact, the article that I published in Dress begins with an illustration from the Girl Scouts of America handbook, because one of the things that she's basing this pin sash on is the, the badge sash that Girl Scouts wear. Um, and I loved um, the idea that just as she was influenced and interested in Black lesbian poetry uh, growing up, she was also very interested in Girl Scouts and other ways that kind of girls found community with one another and the organizations that they found it through. So um, she's kind of riffing off of a more common, often male device for displaying pins and club colors, which is what you see there. You can see the other kind of men around her wearing leather vests, um, which early in leather history was actually um, uh, denim. It was wheat colored denim at first, and then it moved into um, the materiality of leather. Um, but this is essentially a way of gathering one's own affiliation. So um, events that you've attended, people that you know, uh, bars that you've been to, um, there is indeed a whole ritual behind pinning someone um, that by told me about and kind of talks about where you um, kind of pin upside down and then turn it right side up eventually. And in fact, that's really important because some of the pins on the sash kind of contain coded meaning. So the pin that you're seeing kind of in the middle on the right that looks like a top um, was devised by um, a man that Vi told me about who was um, writing for the Bob Hope Show. He was a writer um, on that program. And he wanted a way to signal his kind of leather affiliation or sexual affiliations without um, uh, notifying everyone. And so he developed this pin where if you turned it point side down, which is how it is now, it looks like a top, like a child's toy. And he would wear this as a tie tack, actually. And if you turned it upside down, you'd see a little butt, you'd see a little bottom. <laughs> so so he is kind of communicating something about kind of his sexual, um, his own sexual uh, stylistics, you know, and, and the way that he um, kind of embodies his own sexuality. And so the pin sash becomes this, or what I was struck with when I first visited the Carter Johnson Leather Library um, is just the way in which the pin sash becomes an aggregate ground onto which many divergent experiences are um, are collected. 
Um, and so for me, the pin sash becomes a way of actually telling a communal history. You can look at a, the, this kind of pin sash with many, many pins, and you can kind of begin to parse out lots of different organizations, locations, important people kind of within BDSM communities in the United States. Thank you so much, Andy. And yeah. I apologize for um, pronouncing Vi's name incorrectly. Just oh, no, there. no problem. And in, <laughs> fact, and in fact, I should say that um, when I first met her, she was Mama Vi. But, uh, you know, it's been about 10 or 11 years, and now she's kind of taken up the mantle of Grandma Vi. Um, so most people in the community now know her as Grandma. Um, and, you know, I'm sure other panelists here could kind of riff on this, um, but you know, queer family or queer familial structures are really kind of important in thinking about kind of how we build bonds with one another. And so chosen family is a really important way of kind of thinking about that. And she maintains this kind of broad familial relationship with a lot of the people that she comes into contact with. Thank you so much, Andy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, and then my next question uh, for you, Andy, um, can you go into just just briefly a little bit yeah. um, one of the pins that you had um, dissected in the article, um, the pin that is um, pictured here, yeah. you know, why was it important and some mm -hmm. of the multiple meanings surrounded by it? Well, one way that we know that it's a really important pin, or one way that Vi told me that it was a really important pin is that it was actually separated from the sash itself in a very special box that was enclosed. So she kind of has this, this kind of separation between kind of what remains on the sash and what gets its own special um, kind of placement. And one of the buttons in there that I asked her about was this button because I didn't know anything about it at that point um, was this button that I felt was very provocative that said the LAPD freed the slaves in 1976. And what this is, is it's a, um, it's essentially a kind of a piece of activist ephemera. So on the date that's listed on the button, the LAPD conducted a raid on the mark uh, for bathhouse. Um, which was a um, an institution that was that was you know created so that mostly gay men, almost exclusively gay men, could play with one another um, in an environment that was welcoming and and purpose built for that. Um, there was an organization that was having um, a slave auction, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that and the kind of loadedness of that in just a minute. But um, was having a slave auction on on this date, and the LAPD spent somewhere around the order of like a hundred thousand dollars in um in uh, busting this in a massive raid so they used lapd helicopters they brought two full bus paddy wagons um to pull people into eventually four people 40 about 40 or so people were arrested from that night and they were charged or you know, they were attempted to be charged on um, old statutes relating to both slave laws and prostitution laws um, in California. Eventually, only four people were actually brought to court, and there was an extended legal court battle. And so this pin was produced um, to raise awareness about this court case, to kind of poke a finger in the eye of the police by kind of um, presenting back to them their heroics in this kind of very sardonic way, um, and to kind of just generally kind of raise awareness within the community about this particular struggle and fight. You can find, if you look at kind of images Images of the um, of the Gay Freedom Day parades on the West Coast around the same time. You can find people on the sidelines and marching in the march that have this button or very similar buttons. So it was kind of widely produced and distributed. Um, and for Vi, um, this has a lot to do too with her own kind of positioning of herself within the community. And she's written very, I think, um, lucidly about. Um, what she termed at the time ethnic play. Um, and I'm not pretending that Vi's views on this match everybody's view on this at all. She kind of wrote about the ways in which this event and uh, race play in general within the scene of a kind of BDSM sexual scene um, for her was a very productive way of thinking about her own identification as a black um, submissive. Um, and again, I just want to make very clear that just because that is fine with Vi does not mean that that would be fine with everyone else. And in fact, there is there are really cogent critiques of both kind of Vi's thoughts, but also um, 
the the way that there are certain kind of leather uh, events such as slave auctions that play off of um, or, or rely upon these kind of traumatic events that are related to the genocide of um, hundreds of thousands, millions of black people in the United States in chattel slavery. So it is not something that is kind of taken up very lightly. But for Vi, I think this pin um, speaks to that particular history and to this kind of moment in um, LA BDSM history that she finds really um, kind of fascinating. Thank you very much, Andy. Yeah. <clears throat> Moving on to Michael. Um, Michael, can you first tell us um, the differences and similarities between drag queens and professional female impersonators? And then can you tell us about Charles Charles Pierce, you know, where where he performs a little bit about the evolution of his style? Sure. Thank you, Kelly. I think drag is a cultural phenomenon that most of us are likely familiar with due to its entering into the mainstream in a really predominant way. Um, particularly due to RuPaul's influence over the past 10 years. Uh, but I've been interested in a while in the history of drag. And as I was working to put together materials for my queer fashion class that I teach here, um, I came across another um, component of drag that in the mid to late 20th century was most commonly referred to as female impersonator. Now, female impersonator isn't a term that originated in the mid to late 20th century. In fact, we have examples of female impersonators as far back as minstrel shows of the mid 19th century. But in the late 19th century and early 20th century, female impersonators or um, men who dressed as women for entertainment, most often to pass as a woman as a part of the show and for people to be marveled at that individual's ability to pass and to be beautiful and glamorous. Female impersonators were mainstays of vaudeville acts in the late 19th, early 20th century, with people like Julian Altinge, who was possibly one of the most um, successful and famous female impersonators of the early 20th century who had his own theater um, and who was hired by several apparel companies to advertise products that were being sold to cisgender women because who knows better about whether or not a corset is gonna give you the right shape than a man who's trying to fashion himself as a woman. So that tradition of female impersonation continued into the 20th century, um, both pre and post Stonewall. And Charles Pierce is an example of a female impersonator who began performing professionally dressed as a woman. Um, he was a trained uh, actor coming out of the Pasadena Playhouse where he graduated from in 1948 and found his way into female impersonation first at Cafe La Vie, uh, which was a pun, the life being the gay life, um, in Altadena, California in 1954, when sumptuary laws in cities across the United States made it illegal for people to be dressed in clothing of um, a gender other than what was assigned to them. So early on when he performed at Cafe Altadena, they were raided. Um, he fortunately wasn't arrested that night, but they were raided, but several men were. Um, two men who were arrested that night went on trial. Um, one was a teacher, uh, lost his job. All the names were published in the uh, Los Angeles Times as a way of public shaming. And um, sumptuary laws, and particularly as it relates to female impersonation or drag, were ways that the police found to enact brutality and to enact control on queer and gay communities. Um, so despite that, he persisted and found ways to work around sumptuary laws. Um, one of the ways that he did that was with a set of puppets that he created called lay moppets. And you see an example here on the screen on the far bottom right of a Betty Davis puppet body that he would then place onto his body, which you see directly to the left of that. Um, and he would manipulate the puppet, but he only had to put on a, wi a wig and a little bit of makeup in order to do the impression, so he wasn't technically breaking the law. And actually, early on, he would layer women's clothing. He would dress in a turtleneck and a pair of pants and layer women's clothing on top of that so that if they were raided and he came to contact with the police, he'd be able to show that he was still wearing men's clothes. Um, his career really progressed post Stonewall, um, and he was hugely successful. 
I would say as successful and to a certain extent as well known um, as RuPaul is today. Um, and he was most famous for doing um, very campy impersonations of female gay icons like Mae West, who you see pictured here. Here's the interpretation of Mae West um, pictured here on the left. Um, and as his career progressed, he went from working with puppets um, and working in a tuxedo and putting on like a woman's hat or a feather boa to full glam by the 1980s, which is what you see on the top right of the screen. And I was fortunate enough to find a surviving costume designer who worked with Pierce. His name is Arlie Berryhill. And Arlie actually designed and made the costume that you see here in the top right corner. That's his original sketch. Um, and the sequin gown with matching long coat that illuminated with lights when the coat was extended. Um, and my research was really made possible because Pierce in his own retirement in the late 90s was interested in the hidden history of female impersonators. And he started to investigate and found that there's a rich culture and a rich history, but very little of it has been documented. So before he died, he donated his papers um, to the Billy Rose Theater Division of the New York uh, Library for the Performing Arts. And then after he died, the One Archives acquired additional papers and also several of his costumes um, that were made available to me uh, to complete this research. I'm really glad we could see these uh, rich visuals. Um, and it's interesting, yeah, like compare, you know, thinking about um, how famous Charles Pierce was when we we all know RuPaul, um, or I, most of us know RuPaul. Um, but yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about making that that comparison. Many of it, I'll just say one thing in addition to that that maybe people don't know, but Charles Pierce was on Laverne and Shirley and Starsky and Hutch and designing women. And um, those are the shows that resonate with me in terms of popularity based on my age. Um, so he was able to cross over into an arena that I think is now mostly occupied by RuPaul and those that have been a part of RuPaul's Drag Race. So, so throughout much of uh, your all's work, um, there is this concept, Ben, you had already kind of discussed this um, when you talked about the um, the shirt we previously saw, and um, you had mentioned also the psycho uh, t-shirt, but there, there are these concepts of like claiming and reclaiming, um, and also Andy, you had um, spoke about this as well before, um, but can I, um, you know, either the, you know, Andy and Ben as well, you're welcome to contribute <laughs> There's further examples, but can you all talk about um, or elaborate further on how these sort of intersected and materialized within your research that you were doing this, this idea of like claiming and, and reclaiming and how you, how you sort of saw that manifesting? So for me, the kind of notion or the idea of claiming or self-definition of an identity is really kind of best elaborated within the space of Viola Johnson's archive itself. She um, she employs or uses the volunteer labor of people in her extended queer family, um, most of whom, at the time that I visited the library, all of whom were people of color. Um, but I think that the situation is now most of whom, the vast majority of whom are, are people of color. And she would be very intentional about setting it up as a space um, using kind of invocation traditions that she read about or knows about um, from West African griot traditions or storytelling traditions. And so to me, one of the ways that a kind of space or an identity is claimed, you know, is in the special caretaking of the space, right? Who is in the space? Who is telling the history? Who is being asked? What resources are they pointing towards? And so for, for me, the kind of idea of kind of self-definition comes through how leather men and women that access the archives at these events, you know, are kind of guided by Vi Johnson and the other kind of folks in the library. This is probably one of my favorite parts to write about. Like every time I think about that part in my in that chapter, I was always so giddy. Um, uh, it was a scene in one of the episodes where the models um, reconstructed this uh, crosswalk into a runway, um, and it was very like guerrilla style because the the lights would go red and the, you would see the cars waiting, and then people were just taking up space, the models were taking up that space and owning it as their own. Um, and I really thought that was really special and, and connected to 
uh, what I argue in that article about self-valuation and really demand and, and part of self-valuation as a, as a mode of Black queer style was really about taking up space, taking ownership of a space, particularly when in a context when uh, Black queer women who are gender nonconforming are often told um, in different ways or punished in different ways for being um, um, gender nonconforming in public spaces. And one of the things I connected that to, particularly because I noticed it was taking place at night, was the um, New Jersey Four case. So uh, if people don't are familiar with that case back in 2016, about, it was more than four, but about seven um, uh, black lesbians of, of different gender presentations um, were accosted by a man and a fight ensued. And many of the women were charged for assault on him. And so, um, and there was a documentary out in the night that 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 talks about this um, case and the way that Black queer women um, and and many of the women who were charged and sentenced to I think up to about eleven years um, were um, um, gender nonconforming, masculine presenting. And so, what that was really important to think about, even that case in in the media, how their sort of perception or expression was demonized and they were called this lesbian wolf pack, right? All of these sort of terms, animalistic terms that historically have been used to, um, to dehumanize black, black people, black women in particular. And so I talk about the significance of these models, you know, in their suits and ties and dapper, you know, dapper attire walking across this space and really making it into their own um, in that moment, particularly in a context and in a time and in a, in a setting where um, I, I would think that um, a lot of their, a lot of them were punished or can be punished in society for even, for even doing that. Um, so that was a really fun part to write about in this article. Thanks, Denisha. And I think that actually um, kind of like Ginger um, had asked a question um, in the chat. And I think you kind of just um, you just hit that one on the head, um, you know, because she was um, had has obviously read this, um, read your manuscript because um, you had mentioned these runway episode, which is what you're talking about. And, you know, it, you had described it as this like radical act, you know. And so I think, yeah, like talking about like, you know, the New Jersey four and like this you know, horrific event that happens and then them like taking this space, you know, this, mm -hmm. the, you know, things that we see every day, you know, and especially like at night, right? That's like, was like a, you know, another important component of it. So yeah. Um, yeah thanks. thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so let's move to, I'm going to move to the, um, for this, we have about 10 minutes left of some pre-prepared questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and move to my, my next question. Um, so also there was, in, throughout all of your um, different work, there was this um, idea of, you know, self-definition and ambiguity in relation to identity, fashion style, and the body. Um, so I was wondering if you all could talk about how the individuals work to establish self-definition. And so many of you have already sort of touched upon this, but is there anything to expand upon, um, you know, this idea of these folks who you have engaged with in like self-definition and then also um, ambiguity. And I'll open it up to my panelists, whoever wants to take this one. I should say that Charles self-identified in a term that he coined for himself called male actress. And while it was commonplace that um, I think it would be okay to assume that the majority of men who were performing as female impersonators may have been gay or may have been bisexual or may have had a non-heteronormative concept of gender. Um, it wasn't something that they talked about publicly. It wasn't something that they always claimed because it could have had a negative impact on their careers and their ability to book gigs or press that was written about them. So it was sort of a tongue in cheek thing that people sort of knew but didn't really talk about. Um, and Charles, really felt very strongly about his training as an actor at the Playhouse. 
where he um, appeared in classical productions of things like the Imaginary Invalid and, and other productions um, with many people that went on to be very well known in the entertainment industry at the time. So he felt strong about his training as an actor. And he also had a real strong embrace of his sexuality that was very open for the time. Um, and not all scholars would agree that drag or female impersonation is a positive enactment of gender. But one of the things that I argue in this article is that within a historical context, I think Pierce was um, presenting an act of defiance against a heteronormative status quo. And in billing himself and in talking and correcting reporters and saying, no, 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 I'm a male actress. It really was a way for people to think about he's a man, he's embracing his femininity, but he's also really funny, funny and finding a way to connect with diverse audiences through humor. So I think for him, it was this idea of claiming his place as a male actress um, and trying to embrace his sexuality and his own understanding of his own gender at a time when it wasn't um, something that people generally talked about publicly. Yeah, I think one thing I'll add, I think it was really interesting when we did our recruitment for uh, youth to take part, we partnered with uh, two school boards in two different cities in Ontario. And we originally just sort of invited, you know, any youth who identified as LGBT plus to take part, who wanted to learn about fashion, create fashion. We didn't specifically define it um, as any type of like fashion activism or queer activism because the students also needed permission slip signed. And so this was simply a fashion workshop. And obviously we wanted to protect their safety um, since many of them needed their families to sign it. But when uh, all the sort of youth that wanted to take part came to the workshops with uh, teachers from the school, it was interesting that there were no white, cisgender, gay, males, identified male students. So all of the people who took part were uh, women identified, non-binary and trans identified, um, queer and trans folks of color. And in many ways, this really highlighted for us um, and highlighted in these workshops are which queer and trans youth are in many ways have benefited from sort of single issue queerness and quote queer liberation, at least how it's been embraced by the state and by embraced by the fashion industry and embraced by schools and which um, queer and trans youth who are multiply marginalized are, have still not benefited from policies, have still not benefited from activism, have still not benefited from so much of the quote progress that has been made. Um, and I think this was a really important, really important in one, not just who needed and wanted to take part in these workshops, but who haven't benefited and seen the social advantage from the way fashion has tried to take up, as an industry has tried to take up queer and trans identity or queer and trans inclusion the way the state has. And that's when we really started to move into sort of thinking about this into queer studies and thinking about this concept of homonationalism, um, which I talked about at the beginning, which is right, this idea that certain queer folks are embraced by the state. So the state can be seen as this sort of progressive place, but there's very clear gendered and racial um, inflections in that in terms of it's primarily cisgender, white, queer men who have been embraced. Um, and so I think when we think of fashion, when we think of style, as this panel is really just so beautifully talking about, um, we can't think of obviously LGBT identity without thinking of these deep intersections. And that in particularly in this activism and in this work had uh, very clear connections with understandings of disability and with that. Um, in terms of not just expressing oneself, but finding clothes, being seen as desirable within discourse, um, et cetera. And this particularly was, had a huge impact for queer and trans young people. Um, so um, space and place were also um, really important concepts in your interpretations. Um, so can you all talk about um, or elaborate on you know, why they might have been important into how you were contextualizing um, your research? So one of the things I think about, and, and you pointed out, Kelly, um, is that I don't think it was lost on either one of us that, that this show was filmed in North Carolina um, and in 2013, 2014. And I asked her about that, um, really about the community 
and how they interpreted the work that she did. And um, and it was interesting that she received a lot of pushback even from her own community. And, and, and she talked a lot, Nikki talked a lot about how people weren't really receptive to notions of androgyny or even because I asked her like how is queer style does queer style register to you or your community and so um and she was really talking about a lot of the anti-LGBTQ political climate and even though our interview took place in 2017 and she brought up the um the bill that was passed um uh the tra anti-trans bill that was passed in the um in 2016 her show um, was filmed earlier than that but i think what she was really pointing to is sort of the context right the political climate that actually makes way for policies like that and so um i think a lot of her way of of explaining the reception was really a recognition of the, the larger context in which she was filming this place in but one of the things I really didn't want to do is, is to also be like, the South is terrible and, you know, try to theorize about her participation in it as though this, the South is very backwards. Because I also recognize the role that race, class, um, and gender all sort of play a role in how Black women navigate these spaces. And for many people, and a lot of and a lot of this is taken up in queer of color critique, is like even as they are operating in spaces that are oppressive and um, consider in our like mainstream view maybe backwards as it relates to LGBT communities, right? But these are their homes, these are where their families are, this is where um, their their community and culture is. And so you see a lot of navigating and negotiating with those communities about how or what it means to be um, queer, what does it mean to be androgynous in, in all of these ways. Um, and so I, I try to do that just as I think that is a, a sort of a Black feminist kind of praxis is to say that home is very complicated in many ways. And so how do we hold space for, yes, there's anti-Black, anti-LGBT climates um, that make it restrictive but also these are the communities in which inform the way that they move and navigate the world. This idea of place for Pierce in terms of figuring out where he could perform and where he would be safe to perform. Um, he learned early on in California that it, um, particularly in Los Angeles, that he might have a problem there and, and then started getting booked regularly in Miami Beach, which, which in the late 1950s, was a very different place with a predominantly Jewish clientele in supper clubs um, that were used to kind of borscht belt humor, um, which went along with Pierce's um, campy impersonations and sketches that he did and was very successful in Miami Beach. He tells a story about, he then got a booking for a gig at a bar in Colorado called The Manhole, which he assumed was a gay bar. Um, but when he got there, he figured out that it wasn't a gay bar, that it was a mining community. And so he hot-tailed it out of Colorado as fast as he could, um, but eventually gravitated to the Tenderloin in San Francisco, which um, is a neighborhood that has a long history associated with queer community, where he performed at the Gilded Cage, a gay bar in gay-friendly San Francisco, um, during the same time as the Compton's Cafeteria riots from 1963 to 1969. It was a very long gig, and in fact, that gig ended two weeks before the Stonewall riots occurred in New York City. Um, so post-Stonewall, um, Pierce was able to perform in a wider variety of spaces and places, but early on had to be very strategic about where he chose to perform in order to make a living and also to remain safe. I think we did this, when we did the project, we did it in two different communities. We did it in Toronto, which is obviously a pretty big city. And we did it in Ottawa, which is a smaller city. And place was pretty critical in how the youth engaged and who the youth, yeah, really like their desire to participate and how they participated. In many ways, the young people in Toronto um, were excited, but weren't like, so excited to be there in many ways like they were there but they had met each other before many of them were like oh yeah we, we've met here we've learned about this here in many ways because they were in this 
big city, it was obvious that they had access to so much community and services and supports that were designed specifically to help diverse queer and trans youth. Um, and that there were other points of connection where this was not the first time they had ever met. Uh, many of them, even though they lived in very different parts of the city, had met before and had these networks. Um, and sort of the resources and the supports based on that city were clearly there. Where in Ottawa, in many ways, this was the first time that these youth had ever met each other. For many of them, they were the only out people in their school. And this was like so exciting to actually connect with other youth. The idea of being engaged in, to fashion was also like a very new experience in terms of being able to do that in community. And so in many ways it highlighted, I think the different resources and supports available for queer and trans youth based on location. Um, and then really that in smaller cities that, that doesn't exist and particularly in Ottawa, a lot of the youth would come from rural regions as well. And so this was particularly exciting. I think another conversation that came up in, as we were kind of hacking clothes um, was in many ways, the role of the pride flag. And so many youth in the city were quite like dismissive and critical, were very critical of rainbow capitalism. Um, really were like, well, is this flag really just being appropriated? Is this a symbol for me? Um, you know, all the stores of this at the like on downtown, like I, like right there, there was a deep critique where in the smaller city and the youth that were more from rural regions, um, when they had the opportunity to get pride flags and bring those into their designs. I know one young person created like a shirt, like a, a shirt and then attached on the pride flag as like a kind of a cape and wings. And for them, this was so meaningful because in their school, there were no pride flags up. That was something they never saw in kind of the downtown area of where they lived. Um, this was something that like they'd ordered online and like hid under their bed. Um, and so to have that, that was affirming, that was exciting, that was something that like really for them represented community and had such deep meaning. Um, and there was really not the critique over a pride flag, over corporations incorporating this in many ways, even just coming to the hackathon and seeing, um, talking about corporations having a pride flag was something like, oh wow, does that happen? Like, I've never seen this, that's so exciting. I'd love to be in a place where this happens. And so really I think as we're, critical of corporate engagement in pride and particularly fashion branding and pride and the pride flag and how that's been taken up and fashion places such an important role and in many ways provides a lot of privilege in being able to critique because there's so much exposure and not having that right is a, is a very different experience. Thanks very much Ben. Um, so uh, because we're going to wrap up at 25 after the hour I would like to get to some audience uh, questions. Um, and there've been a lot coming through. So um, I'm gonna start uh, with one um, that was specifically for Denisha. Um, so this comes from uh, Kira. So in your work, um, Kira says, you had mentioned that Nikki Eason wanted to teach the models about liminality um, as being critical to the black woman's soft definition, specifically when they were going into, potentially into the modeling industry. Right. So. Can you talk about like the importance of that idea of like liminality and like the context of like yeah. the you know the androgynous model web series and then like what that what broader modeling industry might look like? Right, and and I think that um, I think when I reread this part, um, going back into her first initial critique of the fashion industry and the way that she felt, even as she felt like. Um, she didn't couldn't appreciate it for herself the the way that a lot of these androgynous models were being more, were being asked to present in a more feminine way. She understood that having models be able to kind of seamlessly or um, move from these sort of masculine or feminine registers of androgyny was really important for how they would um, navigate that fashion industry so that they don't get sort of boxed into these static sort of categories. And I think in part, she was trying to, um, going back to our earlier way of, of talking about self-definition, she was really trying to um, not just have these self-definitions be one way at all times, but being able to say at any given time, you can define who you are. And, it, and I kind of liken it 
um, a lot because a lot of people can read that and be like, well, isn't she giving in to the pressures of the industry? And, and that's not really radical at all. Um, and I think about um, Jose Munoz, uh, uh, Munoz Esteban, um, his work in disidentification, and he's talking a lot about how queer color performers oftentimes use the tools of the dominant culture um, to work on and also work against, right, oppressive structures. And so I think of liminality as being important in this context because it's about really thinking about, you know, and, and there's also the argument about Audrey, Audrey Lore, who talks about the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, right? And so there's all of these tensions, right, um, coming from Black feminists and also queer of color critique and engaging in those. But I think it's really important that um, she is trying to do a type of work to say, I recognize the issue, and yet your interest into this space could be really transformative. And so we can read that in different ways. We can have different critiques about what that means. Is it, is it revolutionary? Is it, is it reformist or whatever? But I do think that it was important to how she coached her her contestants. Yeah, there's certainly you know a lot of tension in like in that idea and like like you said, you know, you can certainly interpret it in a lot of a lot of different ways. It also makes me think of um, Ben and your <laughs> experience with, um, uh, you know, uh, modeling agencies and so forth. So um, I was just making that connection in my in my head. <laughs> um, and then um, let's go with um, so there was a question um, for uh, Michael in the chat. So you talked a little bit about the um, puppets. Is there anything else that you could expand upon? Um, it's a very, it's a fairly unique um, idea in relation to um, your research. Can you just tell us, you know, why, you know, anything else about more as to why they were important and and the ways they were used in um, Charles Pierce's performances? Sure. Uh when he first started doing his act, he, as I mentioned earlier worked with women's accessories or women's fashion items as props. So in order to do an impression of, let's say, Eleanor Roosevelt, for example, which was a popular one that he did early on, he would put on some kind of floppy hat and, you know, a mink piece or a fox piece over his shoulder while wearing men's clothes underneath. And it was well received, but he wanted to and also could tell that his audiences were interested in him embodying the character of a woman more but because it was against the law for him to cross-dress he found a way around that with puppets and um really his training that i've mentioned at the pasadena playhouse he and several of his classmates um puppets in mid 20th century america well like rupaul says everybody loves puppets and in mid 20th century america puppeteers like bill beard and jim henson puppets were all the rage so he had started a, a puppet, a patio puppeteers group when he was in school at the Playhouse. And the idea came to him in that, oh, I can create a puppet, but just use my own head as the head of it so that I can be the character without actually, or be the woman without actually dressing in the clothes. Um, and the Les Muppets, and I'm not really sure which came first, Les Muppets or Muppets, and he wasn't sure which came first either. He later changed the name to The Living Dolls. But throughout the um, late 50s and early 60s, that book, that act, was specifically booked constantly, continuously, um, at a rate of about $600 a week, which was a considerable sum at the time. So the puppets were a way for him to get around oppression related to gender expression and not get arrested, but still um, perform an impression of a woman. Thanks, Michael, for elaborating on that a little bit. Yeah, it's a really, um, yeah, it, it's, um, you know, in many ways, of course, tragic, right, of like, you know, I guess, you know, skirting the um, law, but also inventive, right, so, and, and resilient in many ways, so. Um, I'm going to next ask a question uh, to Ben. Um, and this comes from uh, our audience member, Juliana. Um, and so um, in your work, you had uh, drawn upon Feminist Queer Crip, uh, which is a very you know, in-depth text. 
and there's like a lot to pull from. <laughs> and so can you tell us how you decided upon the various parts of theory that you used in your interpretation, you know, such so as like imagined uh, futures. So like, you know, how did you like decide when you were, you know, when you were um, uh, doing interpretive work with your manuscript, like how did you decide what parts to use? <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm very interested in this question too. <laughs> oh, that's such, well, first of all, Michael, I feel like I need to include puppets now in the next hackathon. Um, I'm feeling very inspired. That's, that has to be part of it. Um, and for those of you that haven't read Alison Kafer's text, it's such a phenomenal book that really will kind of move your mind and challenge worldviews in so many incredible ways. I think, in this work, there are, I mean, I think it's, uh, several things at play. I mean, I think one and for, first and foremost, it was challenging this idea um, of disability um, or, or at really of oppression as always being something that is always marginalized, is always oppressed, where disability is always associated with shame or tragedy. And instead, not sidelining that, right? Sent, like knowing that's part of it, but how does that coexist with understanding the desire, um, the wisdom, the lived lives that disability that in this sense queerness brings into the world? And so really centering this idea that CRIP is to open up with desire what disability brings into the world. And in many ways, part of the hackathon was to honor, to center, to respect these multiply marginalized experiences of oppression, but at the same time recognize that there was real knowledge, wisdom, creativity that came from those experiences and to make space through hacking fashion for that and for both. And not to deny the systemic oppressions, but to also make space for the joy and wisdom. And so CRIP is to open up with desire became an important part of thinking through how really the kind of the ethos of what the hackathons were. Um, the imagined futures were also really important, right? To give people a space to imagine kind of future lives and li and communities and ways of existing beyond sort of normative boundaries, but recognizing that those imagined futures couldn't just be in the future, they needed to be in the here and now, which is also very true to queer studies um, because right for many of these youth, right? what the future looked like, like who knows what the future was and who knows really for many of them with many of their different intersections and for specifically for the youth that were, you know, had chronic illness, that were disabled, um, right, the future, right, dreaming five years from now was a privilege and a privilege that they might not have. And so part of it was how can we use fashion in the here and now to affirm ourselves, to affirm our bodies, to have fun, to bring joy um, in that space of the hackathon. And that, that doing that in that moment was part of imagining a future in the here and now. And as much as some youth were envisioning right, their future lives, for other youth, we also imagined the future being the here and now and using fashion as a way to create that. And so Alison Kafer's text of imagine futures and thinking both sort of the time ahead, in turn, but also thinking of the here and now became really important and letting those coexist when we talked about futures, not privileging one over the other. So this one um, also comes from Juliana. Um, so can you tell us more about how Vi was perceived at the leather events? Um, and you know, you had mentioned that um, she sets up library, the library and gives speeches sometimes in in your paper. Um, and you know, sort of next to like not tying demonstrations or like for bondage or like spanking events. Um, so. And, and also in that picture, one of the pictures that we had on the slide, um, she appeared to be the only uh, white uh, black person. And and Juliana had written only white person. She meant, she had corrected it. She meant only black person. So can you just talk about that? Like, how was she perceived? Like, how was her, like, how was the archive in the library? Were, were people like, yeah, cool, leather event archive, you know, or yeah. is it, you know, what was that like? Yeah, I want to I want to answer that question, but first I also want to kind of give a shout out to Monica who asked a question and I answered it in chat. And there's a version of this panel that's all about punk subculture and fashions, and Monica would be one of the people to kind of contact um, for that. So I just want to say thanks to Monica for that question too. Um, but Juliana, your question's a really good one. Um, you know, one of the things that I do in the larger book project is talk about some of the ways in which 
uh, leather communities are racially coded um, and the ways in which um, the language of leather can sometimes be alienating to people of color, especially um, kind of black folks, but also brown folks too. I mean, I think the there is a certain way in which the language of BDSM, especially language around master and slave, um, is multiply resonant and it's meant to be within an erotic context but for some people that is trauma you know that's not something to kind of engage with sexually and i think i i um i kind of spoke a little bit about that before but in terms of her um esteem within the community she's considered an elder within the leather community um she is i mean i have never experienced uh the kind of love and generosity of spirit that people have for her and her project. And, and part of that is because she's really um, spent a large portion of her life trying to think about, anticipate, and address her community's needs in terms of how they have access to their history and their archives. And this kind of hits on one of the other questions in the chat about kind of what kinds of archives would we want to see, which is like one of my favorite questions in the world. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things to kind of know about Vi and about other leather folks of color at the time is that they are present, they are there, they are part of the community. So, um, but it is, uh, at least as far as I have been able to research, it is a kind of majoritarian white space, um, at least initially. Um, there are uh, important organizations, Vi's Leather Library is one, but um, say for example, the formation of Onyx, which is a organization dedicated to black leather men um, that did a lot of, um, awareness raising in the 1990s and 2000s, there were there was a publication called Black Leather and Color that was published in the 90s, which was all about all of the anxieties and fraught tensions and pleasures um, about being a leather person of color. So there is a, there is a history, a um, there is evidence of, um, of uh, leather folks of color not only contributing to leather communities, but driving the conversations of leather communities. And so, you know, Vi is really special for what she has done for broad-based kind of U.S. leather communities, um, but she is by no means kind of the only important kind of figure of color um, within that community. But I wouldn't, I would be I would be um, remiss if I did not also kind of meditate briefly on the ways in which kind of leather communities, just like many communities in the United States, um, operate under the aegis of white supremacy. <laughs> and sometimes that's over, that's sometimes that's really overt, and sometimes that is that is fairly covert. So it, it's a complicated, it's a complicated topic to be sure, but um, but Vise Johnson is really important in terms of kind of setting that setting that scene. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Um, so we have about three minutes left. So I'm going to ask one final question. So just keep that in mind as you respond. And maybe we can have two panelists <laughs> um, provide a response. So um, this this panel is called uh, Theorizing LGBTQIA plus fashion style and dress. So in what ways, you know, does theory underpin or inform your work or not? And and why might it be important to your research approach? I'll just say really quickly that for me as a dress historian trained in a pretty traditional approach to the study of dress history, um, I've really been pushing myself to use theory as a way to contextualize my analysis of the records of the past. I mean, I think it provides a greater understanding and a way for me to position the information. Um, and I just have to shout out, I think Margaret's on here, but Tina and Margaret were so critical to my very clunky analysis that became better through editing and the jurors of my paper as well. Um, but I think it's a, an area where those of us that are dress historians can continue to explore queer theory, critical race theory, feminist theory as tools to contextualize our research. I would add because Michael is calling out his reviewers that Michael came out to me as one of the <laughs> reviewers of my article. So I have to thank him directly um, as well. But for me, it's really around kind of theorizing archives, actually. So um, one of the things that um, happened 
is that kind of concepts of what an archive is or can be were kind of expanded in the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, I make, I make uh, use of that kind of expansion. So not just thinking about repositories to put things, but how do we have embodied archives within ourselves, what someone like Diana Taylor would call the repertoire, right? Um, and so I, I hope that my paper goes a little way towards articulating different forms of archives that could be useful to community. And I think for me, you know, I, I lead with and I'm grounded with um, Black feminism um, partially because you know, I feel like a lot of the work with trying to theorize queer Black folks um, is about accepting that there are going to be contradictions. And so I think Black feminism gives us a, a place to embrace that as a, as a mode of understanding that that is a part of Black folks' humanity and Black women in particular. And I'm just committed to, to that. Um, and another, you know, reason why is I think people have thought of Black feminism as being sort of kind of like an outdated mode of, of looking at or theorizing um, because of its political nature. Um, and so I, I'm really committed to, to continuing that work of finding new ways of, of developing that. And, and fashion just becomes the, the lens in which I, I try to expand what Black feminism is. And I think my 30 second response would be, particularly for fashion studies people in the audience that making is theory, right? Well, often we, 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 we use theory, we engage with theory through writing, but certainly the hackathon showed that making, creating so much of a practice we're deeply engaged in is a way to theorize, is a way to expand theory, is a way to move in directions, particularly when you engage community in making and you give them making tools and you let them make, that is a way to theorize and one that I hope that our discipline continues to embrace in exciting ways and places on an equal playing field to the written word as a way to theorize and to know. Well, I just want to say thank you to Michael, Danisha, Ben, and Andy. I have learned a ton myself. Um, and I, as I said before, I'm huge fans of your, your work. Um, so thank you so much. And I will pass it over to Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you so much to our panelists and to Kelly for moderating. We'd like to thank you all for attending today. Um, special thanks to the organizers who collaborated on this panel, including our moderator, Dr. Kelly Reddy Beth, CSA VP of Tech, Graham Wetzbarger, and our new Conversations on Dress editor, Ashley Morrison, CSA VP External, Adam McFarlane, the CSA Office with Kate Ann, and Kristen Miller Zone, who is Executive Director of CSA. Please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram to make sure you hear about all of the upcoming episodes of Conversations on Dress and consider donating or volunteering on CSA's website to the organization to support this and other programming. And uh, thanks again for joining us today.